Hello, and welcome to the BV Magazine podcast, your genuine slice of Dorset rural life. This is the first episode for July 2022. I'm Jenny Devitt. And I'm Terry Bennett. And in this first July episode, we hear exciting news of the discovery of a second Roman mosaic at a site in Hinton St. Mary, six decades after the original mosaic pavement was found. We also hear about the opening of a new nature reserve at Beer Marsh Farm, named and in memory of Angela Hughes. Also, how a housing estate in Oakford Fitzpain is providing homes to a new colony of endangered house martins. We'll also hear some of the letters sent to the editor, and finally, about an enterprising and very successful bakery in Wimborne Minster. But first, here's our editor. Hello, this is Laura. This month, having avoided it for two and a half years, we finally succumbed to Covid. Thankfully, we endured just 24 hours of actual awfulness, followed by a few foggy drain days. A week later, and we're pretty much back to normal. And so glad we managed to catch just the mild strain. And we're not alone. Every person we've told has responded that either they or someone they know has Covid currently. It's still out there, despite the lack of masks and distancing, so just wash your hands. Once we stopped pathetically whimpering and comparing, competing, with symptoms, the overturning of the Roe v Wade ruling in the US has been the hot topic of conversation. We have a 15-year-old daughter and she wants to talk about the ramifications for her American friends, the power of governments and a woman's rights over her own body. Our sons are equally as well informed, opinionated and passionate. All of us are fearful over what may come next for America. There are already signs that rolling back abortion rights could prove a stepping stone for the Supreme Court to overturn a whole range of human rights in the US, starting with gay marriage and contraception. We perhaps have more of a personal interest than some. We have an American daughter-in-law, and at some time, I am assured in the far, far distant future, there will be grandchildren. A granddaughter, perhaps, who will grow up in a country which will not allow her to abort an ectopic pregnancy, which may kill her. We know that criminalising abortion does not stop abortions. It just makes them less safe. Anti-abortion groups in the UK work closely with their counterparts in the US, receiving funding and training. And there is a concern that a perceived victory for anti-choice groups in America will lead to an escalation in clinic protests here. The most important thing people in the UK can do to support abortion rights is to be loudly, unashamedly pro-choice. The Abortion Support Network founder Mara Clark told The Independent... The anti-abortion population is less than 10% of the UK. We are the pro-choice majority and we should speak often about not only abortion but all reproductive health issues. So this is me, saying loudly, I am pro-choice. News. Rewriting Hinton's History by Roger Guttridge. Archaeologists are expecting to rewrite the story surrounding Hinton St Mary's iconic Roman mosaic pavement almost six decades after the original discovery. After just two weeks back at the site, archaeologists commissioned by the British Museum have uncovered parts of a second mosaic, plus thousands of other finds ranging from pottery to oyster shells. And DIG co-director Peter Guest said the traditional view that this was a Romano-British villa may have to change. We still have a few questions to answer, but we're beginning to show that the story we thought we understood is actually wrong. We need to start rethinking what was happening in this quiet part of Dorset 1700 years ago. We would like to explain to people in Hinton St Mary, Stermitster Newton and North Dorset what this place may have looked like and how the mosaic might have been used. One of the interesting things is that it is very late The Romans were in Britain for 350 years, and the Roman period ended about 400 AD. Everything we are finding suggests that up until about 350 AD, the site was open fields. But about 350, somebody, or some people, decided to build some elaborate buildings here. They had the finest mosaics that money could buy, and decorated walls around them too. But it was only used for about 50 years before the Roman occupation ended. The original mosaic was discovered in 1963 behind the then blacksmith's forge, now owned by equestrian artist Katie Scorgie. The discovery was big news, not just in Dorset, but in the wider archaeological world, not least because of its central panel, a depiction of a man that's thought could be the earliest representation of Jesus Christ in the entire Roman Empire. 
The mosaic pavement also included depictions of dogs, deer, trees and pomegranates. It is a unique piece of evidence for the spread of Christianity in late Roman Britain, said Peter, a freelance archaeologist trading as Via Nova Archaeology, contracted by the British Museum to lead the latest dig. It's thought that it may represent Jesus Christ. If it's not Jesus, it might be one of the first Christian emperors, but either way, it's important. We now know there wasn't a Roman villa here. There were Roman buildings, but they weren't part of a big farmhouse or manor. Clearly it was a place of importance, perhaps religiously. It could have been a shrine or the focus of an early Christian community, perhaps a monastic one. But it was only an important place for a maximum of 50 to 100 years. Peter believes that there was almost certainly no overlap into the Anglo-Saxon era for the Hinton site. The evidence that the Hinton buildings were not a villa includes the fact that the 8 by 5 metre double room that housed the original mosaic flooring was not part of a much bigger building. It was part of a complex of little buildings. We think that there would have been stables and agricultural buildings. The current four-week dig follows a trial excavation last year and a third season's planned for 2023. It's doubling as a training dig for 15 university students, with pupils of Sturminster Ustock School also involved. New finds include black burnished ware pottery from the shores of Poole Harbour and colour-coated ware, low-value coins from the early 300s, an enamel object that may have been a decorated stud, part of a ring with a stone inside, two lead weights, kiln-fired bricks and stone roof tiles, animal bones, probably of pigs and cattle, and oyster shells. Oysters were a popular snack for the Romans, said Fines officer Christine Waite. Most excitingly but frustratingly, the dig has also unearthed a second mosaic, once housed in a second building 10 or 15 yards southwest of the original. It's of the same date and must have formed part of the same complex. Unfortunately, we only have fragments. The rest was destroyed when this field was ploughed, probably a thousand years ago. I have a suspicion that in its time it was as nice, if not nicer, than the famous one. Surviving parts include a black and white border section, black triangles, and a few smaller black, white and red cubes, which hint at a more elaborate decoration. The high-quality cubes in both mosaics are thought to have been made at Dorchester. One of the first to work on the Hinton St Mary dig 59 years ago vividly recalls the excitement generated as the site's archaeological importance became evident. Retired art college lecturer Jamie Hobson, who's 72, personally helped to uncover the central roundel that turned out to be unique in the Roman Empire. There was a lot of excitement and I remember being filmed by the BBC, says Jamie, who now lives at Salisbury. It was a real quality find. Nothing like it had ever been discovered before. Jamie was a 13-year-old at Sturminster Newton Secondary School in 1963 and he remembers Headmaster Stan Tozer approaching him in the corridor. Hobson, you're interested in archaeology. Walk up to Hinton. Somebody has found something. There he met Dorset Museum curator Roger Pears and a second archaeologist he remembers as being old school. I seem to recall being up there for weeks and not doing anything at school, but that may just be my memory. I loved every minute of it. I and another boy, Colin Lawrence, uncovered parts of the roundel. I went home to Shillingstone, but came back next morning. We were beginning to discuss what it was. Someone suggested it might be the head of Christ. Jamie's last memory of the dig is from a wet Saturday, when they were using water and sand to clean the mosaic and to bring up the colours. The colours were quite intense when we dug it up, but they quickly became dull and that's why we were cleaning it. After that, I think they covered it with glue and paper, rolled it up and took it to the British Museum. Since the British Museum's millennium revamp more than 20 years ago, only the central roundel has been on display in London, with the rest of the pavement in storage. But the digital BV understands that discussions are at an advanced stage with a view to bringing the important Roman artefact to the Dorset Museum in Dorchester or another site. Wherever it goes, we would like to be able to better explain it to the public. It is iconic and not just in Britain. Whether it depicts Jesus Christ or a Christian emperor, it's unique in a Roman world that included the Holy Land. A new reserve is a tribute to Angela Hughes.
by Fanny Charles. A new reserve at Beer Marsh Farm, which is owned by the Countryside Regeneration Trust, the CRT, has been officially opened in memory of the farmer and conservationist Angela Hughes, who died in 2009. A dairy farmer with a passion for protecting and conserving the natural world, Angela championed wildlife-friendly farming. She owned East Farm at her moon on the Stour and bought the nearby Beer Marsh Farm in 1971. She was particularly inspired by its rich diversity of wildlife. The Angela Hughes Nature Reserve was formerly opened by her daughter, Fiona Gerardin. The Stour runs alongside the farm, which is home to barn owls, deer, otters, badgers, hares, bats and butterflies. The North Dorset Trailway, on the former Somerset and Dorset Railway line, crosses the land. Fiona said, This is the perfect way of reflecting my mum's lifetime of work. She absolutely loved the area where the reserve has been created and talked so much of the plans that she had for it. I am so pleased that the CRT bought the farm because they are sensitively reflecting all that she believed in and worked hard to achieve. It holds so many memories for me that it is reassuring to know that the place is in good hands. Angela's many achievements included co-founding Dorset Wildlife Trust. She was responsible for introducing or reintroducing a number of species into the area, including otters to the Stour, and founded Ham Down Woodland Burial Ground. In 1982, she was awarded the OBE for her services to conservation and nature. Danielle Dew, chief executive of the CRT, who was unable to travel to Dorset for the opening, described the new Angela Hughes Reserve as our way of honouring her and all the magnificent work she did in demonstrating, all those years ago, how farming and wildlife could holistically work together. She was both a pioneer and an inspiration, so we hope that the reserve is a fitting tribute to her wonderful memory. Angela was particularly inspired by Beer Marsh Farm's rich diversity of wildlife, in part created by the man-made railway embankments and cuttings. At the official opening, attended by trustees and staff of the CRT and some of the many volunteers and supporters of Beer Marsh Farm, Fiona cut the ribbon to a tree-lined corridor rich in birdsong, wildflowers, bees and small mammals, all testaments to her mother's foresight and conservation commitment. The CRT, which added the 92-acre farm to its nationwide portfolio of properties in June 2020, is committed to keeping alive Angela's legacy. The creation of the nature reserve at Beer Marsh Farm recognises the work she did to achieve her vision of farming and wildlife living in harmony. Founded in 1993 by artist Gordon Benningfield and farmer and writer Robin Page, the CRT was originally called the Countryside Restoration Trust. In April this year, it became the Countryside Regeneration Trust. A spokesman explains, Our regeneration goes much deeper than a name, a new logo and brand colours. These are important to reflect what our charity is all about to the outside world, but this goes to the very root of how we deliver our mission. Across its 19 farms and properties, the Trust is empowering its tenant farmers to run successful businesses that produce vital food for the nation while using farming practices that reverse the decline in biodiversity and play their part in storing carbon to tackle climate change. The Trust has a clear view of the vital role of the countryside. Wildlife, food production, employment, economics and development are all essential. We believe that our future food security, human overpopulation and the biodiversity crisis must be addressed. We believe that nature is integral to good farming. That philosophy is put into practice on more than 2,000 acres of working farms, small holdings and woodlands across the country, where, alongside our tenant farmers, we are demonstrating how regenerative farming increases biodiversity and maintains sustainable food production for every one of us. North Dorset Housing Estate Becomes Top Holiday Destination by Rachel Rowe. If you walk into the old dairy estate in Oakford Fitzpain, you'll need to watch what's above your head. Thanks to a sterling effort by local residents, this new build estate has become a magnet for increasingly rare house martins. 
At the last count, there were at least 36 nests full of healthy chicks among the 35 houses on the estate. It's clearly a home from home for the birds. But how did the human residents help? House martins nest in colonies and can raise up to three broods of chicks in one season, often through to September. Raising more than one brood each year increases their chances of survival. From late August onwards, the birds will begin their winter migration, returning the following spring to breed. However, house martins were placed on the Red List of Birds of Conservation Concern, or the BOCC, in December 2021, after a 72% decline in population over the last 50 years. The reasons behind this are uncertain, but thought to be a consequence of climate change. It's clear they need a little help. Resident Tina Crimes moved into her home in 2017 and noticed a pair of house martins. She set up nest cups and soon had a pair nesting on her roof. The birds may have been in the area before, but as it was previously a chicken production factory, it was probably not an attractive place for any bird to settle. What did attract the birds' attention was the mud and clay soil left by the builders. The house martins found plenty of material to build their homes. When Tina discovered that house martins were a protected species on the endangered list, she stepped up efforts to attract them. I placed a dish of mud outside the house. They love clay-based mud, so I kept it topped up. I also used a call signal downloaded from the UK and Ireland House Martin Conservation Site. The charity was formed to protect house martins, and they sent me some leaflets, which I posted through my neighbour's doors. The leaflets helped inform the neighbours on the estate about the birds so they wouldn't knock down nests and would understand they're a protected species. Tina says most of us love them, though one or two struggle with them, especially if the nest is above a door. But no one has removed a nest. One house has six nests. The birds are high up in the apex of roofs on brick houses, but are not as attracted to render or thatch. Although some residents placed nesting cups on roof areas, some birds nested on top of them instead of inside. However, that's expected. The birds breed more than once in a season and move the bigger chicks downstairs so they can accommodate new babies upstairs. Naturally, with a plethora of nests and cute chicks, there's a different hazard around the houses, with bird mess inevitably landing on paths, cars or people. The birds also clean out muck from nests and are generally very untidy house guests. But as Tina points out, it's easily cleaned away with a hose or a brush. Residents have also taken to placing plant pots underneath the nests to catch the droppings, and some houses have mats on window ledges. Vigilance uh, is required when leaving the house. You never know quite what might land. Tina's proud of the way the communities come together. We've come from all over the country to live here, many from urban environments and unused to anything like this, and yet we've all accepted these wonderful birds into our homes. Watching the house martins swoop around their homes is mesmerising and has been uplifting for the residents. It's an excellent example of how humans and nature can live side by side in harmony and how new housing developments can be adapted to attract wildlife. Features. Letters to the Editor. This is from Dr Charles Matthews, near Sherborne. The decision to close the investigation into the poisoned sea eagle by Dorset Police, despite finding high levels of rat poison in the eagle, was described as completely baffling by the RSPB, who had been helping with the investigation. The decision also coincided with the Force's award-winning wildlife crime officer Claire Dinsdale going on long-term sick leave with stress, a rebranding of the Force's wildlife crime team to remove the word wildlife, and that astonishing outburst on Twitter by Chris Loder MP, who seemed to criticise Dorset Police for spending time and resources on the investigation, and who argued that eagles weren't welcome in Dorset, as per my letter in the May issue of the BV. Now, after large criticism and an FOI request revealed correspondence between Mr Loder and Police and Crime Commissioner David Sidwick, a specialist investigator, has been brought in by police. But this investigator is from the same police force. Is this not a case of marking their own homework? 
Perhaps Dorset Police can explain why the poisoned eagle investigation was dropped in the first place and also share the status of the ongoing investigation into alleged raptor poisoning in 2021 on the very same estate where the poisoned white-tailed eagle was found. Obviously, these investigations are not easy, but the public should be able to rely on the police to conduct a thorough and complete investigation. The next letter comes from Ian Downton of Blandford. I thought Mr Hawes answers in the Q&A, that's the June issue of the BV, were surprising. I'm not a Conservative voter and yet I found myself agreeing with many of his points. In a party of liars, cheats, crooks and tricksters, I appreciate that our own MP appears to be standing up for the right things, no matter who voted him in. This one from Marion Colley of Sturmitster Newton. I appreciated Simon Hoare's honesty in the Q&A this month. However, I felt an absence of his usual forthright and honest tone when discussing the state of NHS dentistry. Sorry, Simon, but this isn't just a simple lack of trained dentists. Every practice is turning away from the NHS because it's not viable to run their business with the funding they receive. I myself received very poor NHS treatment, basically because I needed a three-tooth bridge and the NHS pays a flat fee, barely enough for a bridge. The actual cost of having a three-tooth bridge made is double that of a two-tooth, but dentists are unable to recoup that cost back. So I received an unsuitable treatment, which then required me to go private to get fixed correctly. Not the dentist's fault, a simple lack of funding prevented them from providing the best care. This is not how the NHS is supposed to work. By all means, recruit more dentists, but take a long, hard look at the very model under which they work too, and have a dentist do the review, not a civil servant. The next letter comes from Jenny Baines of Shaftesbury. It was refreshing to read an MP being open and honest and saying in a public forum that he cannot defend the indefensible with reference to Johnson and Partygate. Thank you, Mr. Hoare. You hold in your hands the last remaining shred of trust I have in the Conservative Party. It's not much, but I suspect without decent MPs like you, our country would be in a far worse state. Roger Dorn of Sherborne writes... I particularly appreciated Wendy Darvitt's question for Simon Hoare on the Nolan Principles. Almost 30 years since the seven principles of public life were drawn up, and it seems like people no longer talk about them, and yet we're in need of them more than ever. Just this week we hear that Mr Johnson attempted to use his position to get his then-mistress a job. Is that integrity? Is that objectivity? Had sex with her in a ministerial office during normal office hours? Leadership? Plus, it seems looking at sex in the House of Commons means you lose your job, but actually having it is fine. And then used his influence to pull the independent journalism which had uncovered the fact. The shock is that we're no longer shocked. And the final letter comes from Paul Killinger. He sent it by email. Thank you once again for the latest issue, full of interesting articles obviously not vetted by a commercial director. A magazine with an editor and how it shows... Sadly, as an ex-designer of magazines, local and national, your typography drives me to distraction. No para-indents, wayward and irrational text alignment. I could go on and on and on. I doubt that many of your readers even notice or care. Why am I writing? Because overall, it's a great local asset. Around 70 to 80 ex-employees of mine have, over the years, realised that I am a fully qualified pedant. But only over typography. Good typography is, I believe, a lost art. And editor Laura did reply to Paul to defend the BV style guide, and this is what she wrote. The lack of indents is fully intentional. Every paragraph break is preceded by a subhead, so the indent is superfluous. Text alignment should, in all cases, unless I've missed one, which is error not design, be left. Footer notes are italicised and right align. Typography, like all things, changes with the years. I'll stand by mine. Thanks for the compliment on the content, though, Paul. That means far more. Early Rise in the Breadshed by Tracy Beardsley As a self-confessed insomniac, ridiculously early starts and a punishing work regime don't bother David Myrus. 
His alarm goes off at 12.30 a.m. in the week and midnight at weekends. He works through the night to make dough and prepare pastry for delicious Bakewell tarts, scones and quiches. At 5 a.m. his wife Anne joins him to start on the fillings and the bakery opens at 9 a.m. Before most of us have even got to work, David has already clocked up an eight-hour day and doesn't finish until 2 p.m. Despite the 13-hour shifts, he has finally found his vocation at the age of 55. This is what I was supposed to be doing all my life, says the man who arrived from Australia as a 23-year-old with nothing more than a backpack. A former film and TV cameraman, his claim to fame is that two films he crewed on were voted the worst ever by film critic Barry Norman. He's worked as a linen porter for the NHS, where he met his wife, and a chef in numerous restaurants, pubs and clubs in Australia and London. He also has a degree in art. David now owns his artisan bakery, a family affair along with Anne and son Stefan. It's tucked away down Middle Lane in Wimborne Minster, in a 260-year-old building that has seen many incarnations from a mechanic's garage to a furniture restorer's workshop. With its roaring open wood oven, it's now nicknamed the Breadshed, and I defy anyone to walk past without being tempted to indulge. Its success in just three years has been phenomenal. Starting as a pop-up shop during the Wimborne Folk Festival, the old Malthouse Bakery now has queues snaking around the block for its superb sourdough, 250 loaves sold every Saturday, and renowned jam donuts, 120 sold daily, some partly responsible for my expanding waistline. The alarm going off doesn't bother me, says David. I go to bed about six in the evening and often still can't sleep. I do get bad nights, and if the bread suffers, then I have to start again from scratch. Pastry is a devil. It will punish you if you try and make it when you're in a bad mood. You've got to relax and be in the right mindset for baking. Music helps, and David makes pastry to loud German punk or the more mellow elbow. The World Service is often his nighttime companion. Having a Ukrainian father, he still has relations in Lviv, so the news is of huge importance to him, as is the Ukrainian flag flying outside his bakery. Food has always been a big part of my family life, David recalls. My dad was a real foodie. Being Ukrainian, he'd come home with such delights as pig's trotters and smoked eel for us to eat. David's 27-year-old son, Stefan, is responsible for breakfast baps, cinnamon rolls, tea cakes and those legendary jam donuts. Natasha, his youngest daughter, is also a talented baker but has chosen other paths. His other daughter, Bryony, didn't seem to get the baking gene but she lived in Japan for two years and has come home with new cooking skills to share. With such a foodie-focused family, is there any watershed hour at home to stop talking about business? David says, no, we've always talked about food, so it never feels like we're talking about the business. I've been banned from eating my bread, though. I've got a niece getting married this month, so I've got to get into my wedding suit. It's only 8.30am when I finish the interview. Time for David to lay out his array of delicious temptations as a queue already begins. I leave with a doughnut, be rude not to. I'm glad that I don't have a wedding coming up myself. And the Malthouse Bakery is on Mill Lane in Wimborne and is open Wednesday to Saturday from 9am to 2pm. And that's all in this 1st July episode of the BV Magazine podcast. Join us again in a week's time for more stories of Dorset life. Bye-bye until then.